All right. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm a dog fan, but that ain't, that ain't just, nice. Just right so y'all know, it's that ugly, nice. ugly sweater day. Oh, yeah, I know what you're thinking. Wait, that's not. I just, I just won. You won it. There you go. Ugliest sweater, right? So uh, it's supposed to be Christmas, so I'll just hang that right there. We go. Christmas sweater. So got a few. Okay. Anyway, so uh, I don't want to be anyone's reason they don't come back to church. So I won't be wearing this during the message, so y'all know. Uh, so glad you guys are here today. Welcome to our last Sunday morning. Christmas service uh, here at Bainbridge Church. This is we got one more, and you don't want to miss that. That's Friday, but this is our last Sunday morning service of the year, and I just want to say to you how proud I am of every single one of you. You guys, this year has been amazing, trying at times, but at the same time, it has been an unbelievable year for Bainbridge Church for for you. We've uh, let me see, we fed 21 families at Thanksgiving time. We took care of 42 different households um, to bring a little extra joy into the Christmas season. By, by doing 42 angel tree kids. I mean, that was amazing. And then um, this year we have seen more people get saved and baptized than any year that we've ever been here. And it, I mean, amazing. So 2022, um, man, thank you guys. And by the way, the weather outside is frightful. But you are here when you could be like this in your bed with, you know, the, but you decide, you know what, it's a priority. And so, so, so thank you for being here. If you don't know me, my name is Laddie. If you're in town visiting, um, this is Bainbridge Church. And yes, we are a church, even if it doesn't feel like one, look like one. Everything for us is totally and only and completely about Jesus. We believe that following Jesus makes life better and makes you better at life. And we be, believe he is the only way to, to be with our Father, our Heavenly Father forever and ever. And so we make a big deal about him because he's everything. So it doesn't matter what room you're in or your children are in or when you come, everything we do is centered around that, around that. So uh, we'll put that in the pocket and now we're going to do that again. So anyway, we're so glad that you guys are here. And that's why we do what we do is, is like I said, we believe our mission here at Bainbridge Church is to lead people into a growing relationship with Jesus. And that it is a story that needs to be told. It is a story that needs to be told in every regard, everywhere we go, whether in the mountains or in the valleys. And so as we begin today, we're going to sing a couple of songs and we're going to finish up our series today, close out with a song, and just kind of tie up this season. Now, a couple of things I do want you to know about. Number one, we'll throw these up here on the screen real quick. Angel Tree, we've done. Um, invite someone to Friday night. Friday night is our Christmas Adam service. That's number three on the list. Christmas Adam service is right here, 7 o'clock. We're going to have snacks and hot cocoa and apple cider and coffee and all that stuff. Bring the whole family. Bring your whole family. Fill this place up. We're gonna, we'll have extra chairs whatever. We just want to have a great time beginning this new year, getting our, our, hearts, um, our hearts affection and our minds attention turned toward Jesus uh, during this Christmas season. So make sure you're here Friday night at 7. Um, and then the next service after that will be January the 8th. We, are, we won't have services here on the 25th. We won't have services here on the 1st. Because I don't know if you know it, but it takes a lot more than just me and Chad to run this place. There's 40 people who are here every week serving you, serving the children and, and in this room and all that. And, it's, and, and, and so we want them to have a break. So we will not have church services on the 25th or on the um, uh, 1st. But you do need to follow us on Facebook and you need to make sure you have our app because we're still going to be posting stuff. It's not like we're going silent, not radio silence, okay? We're going to be doing stuff. Chad's going to be doing devotions. I'm going to be doing, it's going to be a lot of fun. So make sure you're tuned in to that. And um, yeah, I think that's about it. So to get us into this first song, I need everybody on your feet. Everybody on your feet. It's, it starts out like, an, like it's not a Christmas song. And then it's like, oh, there it is. But this is a song that talks about how we are supposed to be vocally evident about what Jesus is to us and how he has changed our world. So you go tell it on the mountain. the power of sin and darkness, whose love is mighty and so much stronger, the King of glory, the King above all kings, who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder and leaves us breathless in awe and wonder, the King of glory, the King above all Over the 
truth and justice shines like the sun in all of its brilliance. The King of glory, the King above all kings. so fun, man. Y'all all look so good, but uh, besides my wife, there's only one guy looking better right over there. He's got the same sweatshirt Whoa. I got on. That's what I'm talking about, sir. <laughs> man, do y'all realize um, that Christmas is more than just your presents, uh, more than just the mistletoe, amen? Uh, it's more than even family and friends. Um, we all know the true meaning of Christmas is Jesus. And, um, but I want you to realize that we are celebrating his birth, um, but man, he's much more than just a little baby boy now, you know, he's someone that we need to be learning, um, and it needs to be a habit that we call on him in times of need, uh, when things are going good through the ups and the downs, he wants a relationship with us. And, um, this song has been the I've not been asked to do any song more than this one. Um, and I didn't ever think we would do it, to be honest with you. Um, because I, it's called Mary Did You Know. I sang it so much when I was a kid, I just sing the words. And I forget to ask myself, and maybe you have done the same thing, do we know who he is inside of us, that Holy Spirit, God, Jesus? Do we really know? child of God, do you really know the power inside of you, the power that you can call on? Man, did Mary know? I think so. <laughs> but the question is, do we? So if you know this song, and I know most of you guys do, and uh, y'all help us sing it. Mary, did you know? Mary, did you know that your baby boy would one day walk on water? Mary, did you know that your baby boy would save our sons and daughters? Did you know that your baby boy has come to make you? This child that you deliver will soon deliver you. Mary, did you know that 
that your baby boy would give sight to a blind man. Mary, did you know that your baby boy would calm the storm in his hands? Did you know that your baby boy has walked where angels try when you kiss your lips? You kiss the face of God. Mary, did you know? Did you know? Did you know? Did you know? Oh, Mary, did you know? Did you, did you know? know? Did, did you know? know? The blind will see, and the deaf will hear, and the deaf. Mary, did you know? Ooh, did you know? Glory is to come. Glory is to come. If you just hold. Just 
Please pray with me. Father God, I, Chad kind of already touched on what I wanted to say, Lord, but in this song we ask, Mary, did you know? But what I want to know is, do we know? Do we know that God can live within us? Do we know that God is the grace that we've searched for our whole life? He is the peace that surpasses all understanding. He's the reason for the season. He's the only reason that we can have salvation and eternity that we can just let go of all this that we face on this earth, this pain, this hurt, this remorse, this guilt. God, he is the one that will bring us joy, fulfillment, and the love that we can't even understand. I pray that everybody here, Lord, will know that today, that they would live it out, Father, and that they would find you, go closer to you, Lord, and just let you work in them, Father, so that they can just have that life that you want them to have, Lord pray this in your most precious and most holy name. Amen. You may be seated. Well, good to see everybody. It is part four of our series called Give Me Jesus. And so I'm so glad you guys are here. And it looks like you brought some family with you. So if it's your first time, good to see you. Uh, If it's your first time in a long time, welcome home, welcome back. Um, We're just going to continue right on. This has been a, a great series for me. I don't know if you got anything out of it, but just looking at Christ showing up in the Old Testament. And then today, we're actually going to look at him, you know, coming in in the flesh. And so before I get too far ahead of myself, I want to start with the scripture that we've been starting off with um, throughout this series. And it's John chapter 5 and verse 39, where Jesus is talking to the smart people who know the Bible, the Old Testament. He says, you search the scriptures because you think in them you have eternal life. But actually it is in these, and these testify about me, that the Old Testament, Genesis all the way to Malachi, speaks of Christ. It speaks of Jesus, and, and we miss it a lot. And we introduced a new term that some of us didn't know before, and it's this word here, a Christophany. A Christophany, and this is a physical or non-physical appearance of Christ in the Old Testament. And there's at least 12 of them. We've looked at three of them. Remember, we looked at Joseph, I mean, sorry, Jacob, where he wrestled with an angel, which we know wasn't an angel, it was Jesus, and he wrestled with Jesus, and it was at that moment that he realized that there's a great truth he needed to know. And then we, we, we went back and looked at where Jesus visited Moses in a burning bush and kind of said, listen, you thought your life was going this way, but I'm here to show you a different way. And then we looked at this amazing story of these three Hebrew boys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and they were in a fiery furnace, and Jesus showed up then, too, to get them out of a situation, and, and because of their integrity, just a miracle happened. And so as we've been looking at those, and the whole point of doing this was to show that this same Christ that, was, that showed up in the Old Testament came in completeness in that manger 2,000 years ago. 
which brings us up to Christmas. Now, this word, it's an old word, been around for, you know, since 1036 or so, and uh, just basically means Christ, which is Messiah, anointed, um, and mass, which is a prayer or a liturgical prayer. And, and so we just use this word. It basically just means a time where you focus on Christ. And so we just t- took this whole holiday season and said, this is Christmas time. And so we celebrate the coming of Jesus during this time we call Christmas. But what actually happened was the incarnation. Uh, that's another theological term. Carne, if any of you um, love chili con carne, which is chili with meat. Some are no meat chili eaters. Any of those in the house? No, everyone likes meat in their chili. You're all Christians. Very good. Um, incarnation means basically God wrapped in meat is what that the carne is, flesh, meat. And so when G- the incarnation, the coming of Christ, that what we celebrate on December 25th is the Christ coming in the form of 100% man, 100% God in the baby that we call Jesus and growing up 33 and a half years and teaching and preaching and doing miracles and ultimately dying for each and every one of us. And so today what I want to focus on is we take this Christ, Christophany thing and take it all the way through to Jesus coming wrapped in flesh. I want to focus a little bit on this word here, gifts. There are many things that don't line up with the scripture that we celebrate and we do and songs that we sing and practices that we have that are not in the Bible, okay? And so I'll pop a few bubbles for you just in case you were wondering. Christmas trees, I'm a fan of Christmas trees. I got one in my house, not in the Bible. In fact, I wouldn't encourage you to read Jeremiah where he specifically says pagans chop down trees, put them in their house and decorate them. Uh, So you might skip over that verse if you want. Like I said, I'm a fan of trees, but not a biblical concept. Here's another one, a song that we sing. We'll probably sing it Friday, Silent Night. I've been to two births, wasn't very quiet, okay? Doesn't matter how much epidural there is, it's not a silent night when there's babies being born, okay? But we sing that and it's, you know, special and intimate, but not entirely, probably accurate. Um, let me see, I wrote down a, let me see, I wrote down another one. Oh yeah, here's a fun one. Santa. I'm a big fan of Santa, okay? Big fan of Santa. He's not in the Bible, just so y'all know. And Jesus is better than Santa, kids, okay? So any kids in the room, Jesus is better than Santa. You wanna know how I know? Santa, kind of a Pharisee, to be honest. He's got a naughty list and a nice list. And he's like checking it and making sure and you get if you, if you do good and you don't if you don't, where Jesus is better than Santa in that he says, everyone's naughty. I'm the only one who's ever been nice and I'm gonna take the price and the cost for all your naughtiness and make sure you get away into my heavenly father. So Jesus is better than Santa. I'm pro Santa, but Jesus is better than Santa. So a few things, and as we go through the text today, we're gonna debunk a couple other things. But one thing that is, that is biblical that we do every year is gifts. We're going to see where gifts were brought to Christ and, and what that means and how that kind of teases out in Scripture and what that means for us today. But there is no greater gift than the gift that our Heavenly Father gave us in Christ, that He Himself is a gift. And we know that a good father knows how to give good gifts to his children. Jesus said that. And the entire Scripture, if you were to sum up everything from Genesis to Revelation, it is a story of a amazing, loving heavenly father who is doing everything to get us back into relationship with him. And everything he does is a gift. That from the very beginning, a perfect and holy God had a relationship with us. In fact, it was God with us in the garden, looking each other in the eye, walking in the garden in the cool of the day, actually having conversation, God with us. And then we mess that up. And don't blame Adam and Eve. You would have done the same thing too. You sinned 10 times before you got here. You would have done it there too, right? Me too. So we're not gonna, it's not that. It's every one of us have done this. And so we would all be in the same boat. And so he does the only thing he can do. I gotta get them out of here so I can finish out this plan that I I've had from the beginning to create God with us again. And so I will be bringing Emmanuel, my son, the gift who will bring us back together. The entire story is about a father bringing the children home so he can keep giving perfect gifts to his kids. And so gifts are a big deal at Christmas time. It's a big deal in scripture and it's perfectly fine to do that. So as you're giving gifts, just make sure that, you know, Jesus is wrapped up in there somewhere during this Christmas time. So we're going to be in Matthew chapter 2. Now, 
um, which is actually after the birth of Jesus. So if you were co- coming thinking, all right, we're going to get to hear the story of Jesus on this last Sunday morning service before the new year, uh, I hate to disappoint you. We're not going to actually read the story of the birth of Jesus. What I would do is highly encourage you on Christmas morning, ladies and gentlemen, open up your Bible with your kids sitting around you and read Luke chapter 2 to them and start Christmas morning off by reading the story of Jesus. We're actually picking up in Matthew chapter 2, which is just after the birth of Christ. And so if you have your Bible, Matthew chapter two, here we go. Now, after Jesus was born, after, that's important, born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, we'll talk about him in a minute, Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem saying, now already in this verse is a lot of stuff that changes things that we do, all right? First of all, the, the Magi were not there at the birth of Jesus. So every single one of our nativity scenes are wrong. Okay, every single one of them, they're not, cor- they're not biblically correct. Leave them. I'm, a, I'm pro nativity scene. I'm just telling you, if you've got wise men in your nativity scene, it's not biblically accurate. They didn't come for two years later. So if you want to have a biblically accurate nativity scene, take your wise men and put them in the kitchen. And then when people come and ask, where are your wise men? Like, they're on their way. They're on their way. They're trying. Okay, they'll get here eventually. They got a long way to travel. Okay, that would be more biblically Accurate. <clears throat> now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem, Judea, in the days of Herod the king, Magi, this word is where we get our word magic from. They were not magicians. They were astrologers, astronomers. They were, they were people of science. Just like any good magician knows how to work the, the realm of scientific fact, which is what makes things so astounding because they know how to bend the rules a little bit and make things appear as if they are, even though they aren't. That's what a great magician does. These guys are not magicians. They are astronomers, astrologers, and science people who are watching the stars and, and all of a sudden they see something that they knew was predicted. And so they, they follow and they come from the east and they arrived in Jerusalem. They were not in Bethlehem. They were not at the manger. They came a couple of years later. Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? Here's some more information. So they had information about this coming king, even though they are on the other side of Babylon in Persia. So little hint there by telling you Babylon, where would these wise men have heard the story of a coming Jewish Messiah? Well, we just talked about that last week because At some point, Nebuchadnezzar kidnapped and took into captivity a bunch of Jewish people, including ones that we've named, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and carried them over to Babylon. And they began talking about this God that they believed in. And they began sharing Old Testament scriptures, whatever they had on them, fragments or whatever, letters. And they shared them amongst people. And so Babylon and Persia had heard about these prophecies about a coming king that would eventually come. So that's how they heard about it. By the way, how many wise men were there? Anybody got a guess on that? We say three. There wasn't three. There wasn't three. There's three gifts. And that's why we say there's three wise men. More than likely, these these guys did not travel with just three of them. If they're coming from that far and based on the magnitude of their gifts, there was probably a caravan of people. It was a bunch of people. So once again, buy seven or eight more wise men and put them in the kitchen, and that will probably be a little bit more accurate. So a bunch of them. And here's another one that's interesting. We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. His star in the east. A lot of times, especially like in the song, The First Noel, it says that that a star rose in the east. Not accurate. Because where are they? They're in the east. So in order for them to follow a star to get to Jesus, where does the star need to be? In the west, not in the east. So what this is, is actually the, the, the grammatical way of saying this correctly, is that we saw his star in the east where we live. They were in their east, in their town, and they saw a star while they were there and then moved towards it, which carried them west to Jerusalem. We saw a star in the east where we live and we have come to worship him because that is what you do when you go hunting a king. Next, when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. Well, of course, he's king. You're telling me there's another king being born? Yeah, I'm gonna be troubled. And then all of Jerusalem being troubled probably means this was a large group of people. Like I said, a caravan that is disrupting kind of the town of Jerusalem with all of their you know, ways from way out there and differences and dress and music and all that stuff kind of caused the disturbance. By the way, side note for a second. Matthew, the book of Matthew is a tremendous book to read if you wanna know the story of Jesus because Matthew wrote to the Jewish people. And so what, what he did was make sure that they knew about the amazing prophecies that Jesus fulfilled, one thing. Secondly, the book of Matthew begins with the story of people being invited to Jesus who are nothing like Jesus. The, the book of Matthew starts with shepherds being invited by angels to the birth 
Shepherds didn't get to go anywhere or do anything. They were the lowest class. They couldn't go worship. They couldn't, they, they couldn't even voice, have a voice when they were taken to, um, to, to the judge. They, they could not testify in court. They couldn't worship at the temple. They were the lowest of the low, yet the angel came and said, you need to come and be a part of what God is doing in the world. And even to the far east of Persia, to these wise men who do not believe like they do, know what they sing, what they sing, none of that stuff. They were invited to come to Jesus. That's how the book of Matthew begins. You know how it ends? With Jesus saying to his disciples and to each and every one of us, go to the nations and invite them to me. It's beautiful the way the book is designed and how he teases this out. So anyway, uh, going back to the text here. Gathering together, this is Herod. He gathers together all the chief priests, the scribes, the people, and he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. He didn't know, so he pulls in the best and the brightest of the Jewish world who knows the Old Testament and says, where did the Bible say, where's the book say, where's the, the you know, say that Jesus is going to be born or the Messiah is going to be born? He wouldn't have said Jesus. They said to him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for this is what has been written by the prophet. And they quote it. They actually get out Micah 5 and say, okay, this is what it is. And you, Bethlehem, land of Judah, are by no means least among the leaders of Judah, for out of you shall come forth a ruler. What kind of ruler? The one who will shepherd my people Israel. And so they, they read that out loud to Herod, and he's like, huh, okay. You would think that because these people are the scribes, the Pharisees, they are the religious people of the day, that as soon as these wise men come from the east and say, we're hunting down the king of the Jews, the, guy, the one you guys have been waiting for forever, we followed a star and here we are. Where does your text say he's going to be? Bethlehem. That's where we're going. Do you know how many of these guys went with him? None. None. The religious people who knew the Bible better than anybody missed Jesus. Do you know who the hardest person in the world to get saved is? A church person. Because they know too much. And that's what's happening. It's, it scares me. It scares me that the more knowledge it seems, and when you read the text, you read the New Testament, the more knowledge you have of the Bible, the more possible it is to miss Christ. Because every single one of them missed him. It's crazy. Now, they quote an Old Testament scripture here. One that Jesus fulfilled. Now, this is just a side note again. I just thought it was interesting and the nerd in me, okay? So like five of you are gonna like this. The other 95% of you can just tune out for a second, okay? But I thought that this was really interesting. So I, I, I did some research on this. Do you know the odds of fulfilling one prophecy? Like if a prophecy was made about you 700 years ago, which is when that one was made of Jesus, 700 years before he was born, there's going to be someone born in Bethlehem. That's where the baby's gonna be born. Do you know the chances of fulfilling one prophecy? It is one in 300,000. Now, that's not that bad. It's like, okay, one in 300,000 chance to fulfill that prophecy. The problem is, once you get more and more prophecies, it increases exponentially as to the chances of it being fulfilled. For instance, if we just go up seven more, what are the chances that a human being can fulfill eight prophecies prophesied about them before they were born? Prophecies that explain what city you'll be born in, to what family you'll be born to, what someone's going to say about you or do to you, what you're going to say to somebody else. I mean, the chances of fulfilling eight of those is one in 10 to the 17th power. I'm not smart enough to know how big that number is, okay? I just know it's like a lot of zeros, but I, I did some research to figure out what that looks like because I need pictures. If you were to take a silver dollar and I, we got enough silver dollars to cover the entire state of Texas. Anybody ever drove across Texas before? It takes a day, okay? It's a long time. It's a big state. If you were to cover the entire state of Texas with silver dollars, the entire state with silver dollars, knee deep, knee deep. That's a lot of silver dollars, okay? And then I took you there and I marked one of them and hid it in the state somewhere and then blindfolded you and had you walk out, and I told you, walk for as long as you want, many miles as you want. Take a left whenever you want, take a right. And whenever you think you're at that one that I marked, you bend down and pick it up. And then we take the blindfold off. And the chances that you picked up the one that I marked is that number. Unbelievable. It's crazy. Impossible, some would say. Let's go up a notch. What about filling 48 prophecies? I mean, if, if eight's difficult, nay, impossible, what about, what about 48? 48, the chance of filling, fulfilling 48 prophecies is one in 10 to the 157th power. We don't even comprehend that number. That is more 
That number is larger than the number of electrons in our known universe. That's impossible. This is the chances of a tornado going through a 747 graveyard, and by the time it finishes, it has fully assembled a completely working and functional plane. It's impossible. Do you know how many Jesus fulfilled? Over 300. Over 300 prophecies he fulfilled. That he, in that moment, if you're just a human being, you have no control over it. There is only one explanation for one person who can do this. They must be God. That's it. They, when I did all this research, I was reading this paper about this guy, and this guy is a professor, and he had a bunch of students, and they did a lot of work, Stanford, Yale, blah, blah, blah. This is his, when he finished doing the study, this is his paragraph of the final sentence of this summation. He said, any man who rejects Christ as the son of God is rejecting a fact proved perhaps more absolutely than any other fact in the world. And Matthew wants to make sure people know this isn't just a guy. This is Jesus. This is God in a bod. This is the one that God has been telling us about from the beginning of time, and he's fulfilling every single thing that he ever said he would do. Pay attention to this Jesus. Going back to our story. That was free. Land, yeah. Put in your back pocket. You might need it one day. Then Herod secretly called the Magi and determined from them the exact time the star appeared. Why did Herod do this? Because he wanted to see exactly how old that child might be. And then if you know the story, you know that he went and slaughtered every boy under the age of two in the city. Terrible guy, terrible guy, all about himself. He then, he sent, he, and he sent them to Bethlehem and said, go, search carefully for the child. And when you have found him, report to me so that I too may come and worship him. Lion, he is lying. I mean, this is a terrible guy. Herod was only concerned with his own kingdom. But not only did he, you know, try to, we know for a fact that he, he thought that his mom might take over, you know, his reign. He had her killed. His two brothers had them killed. And then he knew how much everybody hated him. He knew that when he died, no one would mourn him. So he kidnapped 12 of the most loved people in the city and told his army, when I die, kill them as well, because that way somebody will be crying in Jerusalem. Just a terrible king, this guy that, and of course they got out of, they escaped, right? Because an angel came to Mary and Joseph and said, y'all need to go to Egypt for a while till Herod dies. And so they escaped the slaughter. Um, moving on. After hearing the king, they went their way and the star, which they had seen in the east where they live, went on before them until it came and stood over the place where the child, not baby, child was. Because now he's about two. He's a toddler, toddler Jesus. Okay, walking Jesus, maybe talking Jesus, but not baby Jesus. When they saw the star, when they saw that it was right there and they knew exactly that's the house we're going to, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. Why? Man, it's been a heck of a journey. And by the way, joy is the proper response to being in the presence of the king. And this is what they were searching for. We want to find the one who is king of the Jews. I don't care if he's this big or this big. We believe him to be king of the Jews and we're going to worship him appropriately. After coming to the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell to the ground and worshiped him. It's kind of a crazy scene. This Hebrew couple, this Jewish family is sitting there, you know, quiet and Mary and Joseph and Jesus. And, and then these guys who don't look anything like them, smell anything like them, talk anything like them, they come in and they start worshiping their child. It's crazy. But then they did something. And it's only found in this, in this book, in the book of Matthew. They brought three gifts. Then opening their treasures, they presented to him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. As I was thinking about this, I was like, you know, how hard is it to buy from my wife? Like, I'm not good at it, okay? Love her to death, I'll give her anything in the world. I just wish she'd tell me because I don't know what to do. Like, I'm at a loss. I don't know what to, I'm terrible at giving gifts. What do you give a king baby? Like, what, do you, how, what kind of gift is that? You know, I don't even understand. And so I think that these guys, they didn't just like shoot from the hip here. I think when they were thinking about what in the world do we bring to the king of the Jews, these are not just random things they found lying around their house. I think these have a specific purpose in the story of the life of Jesus. Let me show you what I mean. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Gold. Gold is a gift for a king. 
We see this over and over again in the text. Whenever a king goes to visit another king, a queen visits a, uh, a king, or anyone goes to visit a king, they bring gold. It's a way of saying, I surrender or I submit, uh, you're ahead of me, whatever. It, was a, it is a gift you give to a king. While Jesus was on the planet, he was uh, observed, um, understood that there is a kingdom coming and he is the king of that kingdom. It started with John the Baptist when Matthew chapter three, he's, he's preaching to people and you know he's wild and crazy looking, but he keeps preaching. And one of the things he says is the kingdom of heaven is at hand. In other words, it's right here. It's, a, it's opening up. It's about to happen. And then, look, there he is, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. G, uh, John the Baptist announced the coming king, Jesus. And then Jesus, over 21 times, more than that probably, but at least 21 times he says and he teaches, the kingdom of heaven is like, the kingdom of God is like, over and over and over and over again. And it's all about making sure, do you know the king? That this question is important. Do you know the king? And he begins telling us, let me tell you what the king is like. Let me tell you what the kingdom is like. Let me tell you what the kingdom of the king is like. And he would just begin to tell parable after parable, story after story. And some of the most frightening ones to me are found in Matthew chapter 25. And we don't have time to go through them all, but he tells three parables. And he begins them with the kingdom of heaven is like, the kingdom of God is like. And the first one is, is he tells the story of 10 virgins. And you can read the story. It's an amazing story. But the bottom line is there's a party that's gonna happen. And you want to be in the house when the party starts. Because if you're not in the house when the party starts, it's not going to go good for you. And he tells this story, and there are five of the virgins making it into the party house before the party starts. And they're having a good time. And there are five that didn't make it before the party starts. And they're knocking on the door. And the owner of the house opens the door. In this case, it is the king. And he looks at them, and he's like, you know what? I don't know you. I don't know you. You didn't get in before the party started don't know you. And then he tells another story about these, this rich man who's going on a journey and he's got these three servants and he gives them money from his kingdom. Like, this is my kingdom. I'm handing you some of my wealth and I want you to treat that wealth as if it's your kingdom. You are part of my kingdom. Live as if you're living in my kingdom. And he gives one of them some and he gives another one a little bit less and another one a little bit less. And then he leaves. <clears throat> and then he comes back and he's like, how'd it go? And the guy with the most said, hey man, I doubled it. I acted like it was your kingdom, not mine. Boom, I turned it into something. And he's like, well done, good and faithful servant. You can enter into rest. Second guy comes up. Yeah, I did the same thing. You didn't give me as much, but I did everything I could with it and I doubled it. Well done, good and faithful servant. Hey, where's that third guy? Where's that stuff I gave you? Well, I was scared to death because I was only worried about my kingdom. And so I took what you gave me and I buried it because I was scared what you might do to me because it's all about my kingdom, only worried about what's going on in my life. And he says, you know what? I don't know you. If you're not about my kingdom, I don't know you. The third story, perhaps the scariest one of all, it tells a story about this situation where there are sheep and there are goats. And the sheep are on the right and the goats are on the left. And he says to the sheep, he's like, listen, you guys are doing exactly, I'm paraphrasing, okay, but you guys are doing exactly, enter into the, the beauty that is, is my kingdom. You're allowed to come in. Well, why? Because I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you made me well. I was a stranger and you visited me. I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. And they said, well, when did you do that? And he said, when you treated my children as if they were mine in my kingdom, when you loved the least of these, you behaved as if I was your king. And so I know you come in. And then he turns to the goats and he was like, depart from me. Why? Because when I was naked, you didn't clothe me. When I was hungry, you didn't feed me. When I was thirsty, you didn't give me anything to drink. When I was in prison, you didn't come visit me. Well, when didn't we do that? When you saw my children in my kingdom hurting, you did nothing for them. Therefore, obviously you care nothing of my kingdom. I don't know you. So that's a great question. Do you know the king? But perhaps a better question is, does the king know you? Does the king know me? Is it obvious that I'm a part of his kingdom? Is it obvious that his kingdom is bigger than my kingdom? Or am I just trying to pull a little bit of him into my big old kingdom? And hey, I'll just need you when I need you here and I'll get you when I get you here. And oh, by the way, I lost my job, I need you, but now I'm good. You know, I got a raise, I'll call on you when I need you. Is it just invi us inviting him into our kingdom? Or are we abandoning our own kingdom to actually live for the king? And Jesus tells the stories as a king saying, this is what it looks like to be a part of my world. So are you at the party or are you on the outside? Whose kingdom do you operate from? Are you still operating from your own? How are you treating the children of the king? 
These are the criteria that, and it's not about doing. We don't get to heaven by doing. These are evidences of a failure to submit to the king. It's not that if you do these things, then you're in. It's one who's already in does these things. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing and a scary thing. And there, there's a scripture in, in Revelation. And if you're new to Bible study, I wouldn't recommend jumping into Revelation, okay? Start in John or whatever, but I'm a professional. So we're going to jump in. Revelation 21, here we go. That's supposed to be a joke. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there is no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. Listen to this. And I heard a loud voice from the throne. Who sits on the throne? A king sits on the throne. Saying, behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. And he, the king, will wipe away every tear from their eye, and there will no longer be any death, and there will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. And he who sits on the throne, the king said, behold, I'm making all things new. And he said, right, for these words are faithful and true. Then he said to me, it is finished. It's done. I am the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. I will give to the one who thirsts from the spring of the water of life without cost. He who overcomes will inherit these things and I will be his God. He will be my son. This is Jesus speaking as king from the throne at the end of all things. He is king. And the Magi knew it. And they worshiped him as king. The Magi understood that this child, this toddler, was not just a king, but the king. The second gift they gave is frankincense. Frankincense frankincense is for a priest. This is that smell you smell. We all buy incense, or some of us anyway. If you don't, then you might be like me, where when that friend comes over that your son invites over and they smell like this, you question their parents, don't you? You're like, what do they do over there? Anyway, this is frankincense, okay? It's just something you burn. It creates a smell, an odor, and, 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 a, and a, um, a smoke, something that goes up in perpetuity. And, and the, the idea here is that a priest uses frankincense in the worship of God in the temple. And it burned all the time. And this was something that had two purposes. Number one, the scent reminded us that we were in the presence of God. But secondly, the, the smoke that would rise up was a symbol of our prayers constantly going up to God. And so th- when they gave him frankincense, it was to say, we believe you are not just a priest, but you are the priest. You know what a priest does? A priest is the mediator between a perfect and holy God and unrighteous and imperfect mankind. That's what a priest is. You read about the Old Testament and the way the temple was built and the way the high priest would serve the people once a year, even at the time when Christ was here and the temple was in full order. There were sacrifices given all year long, but one day called the day of atonement, they would find the perfect lamb and they would take that lamb and the priest would pronounce all of the sin of the people on the head of that lamb, on the perfect lamb. Then he would take that lamb and take it to the altar and slaughter it and spill its blood. Then he would take the blood and he would go into what's called the holy of holies or the most holy place. And he only did it by himself and he only did it once a year and it had to be him. And he went in with a rope tied around his ankle in case God showed up and killed him. They could pull him back out again. But he went behind the veil into the Holy of Holies and he sprinkled the blood on the Ark of the Covenant. You know, it was inside the Ark of the Covenant was three things that represented the sin of humanity. And so he sprinkled the blood on the top so that when God looks down, he doesn't see the sin underneath, but he sees the blood of the spotless lamb. And that was done once a year by the high priest. And these men, these wise men from the east, to give Jesus, give him as, an, as a child this frankincense saying, not only are you a priest, but you are the priest, the great mediator, the one who is between us and God, the one who takes unholy us and is able to provide a way to holy him, the only one who can provide a way. The book of Hebrews talks about Jesus being a priest. Look at this. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things to come, he entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, not the one that we see when we look out over there, not that one, but the real one, 
That is to say, not of this creation and not through the blood of goats and calves, But through his own blood, he entered the holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling, those who have been defiled, sanctify for the cleansing of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from the dead works to serve the living God? For this reason, he is the mediator of a new covenant sealed in his blood so that since a death has taken place for the redemption of the transgressions, payment for the sins that were committed under the first covenant, grace Law, every one of us are lawbreakers and through the grace of the blood of Jesus, we are forgiven because he bought back, took on our sins so that that were committed under the first covenant. Those who have been called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. The Magi knew he was a priest, not just a priest, but the priest. So, Looking at these gifts, the Magi knew he was king and gave him gold. They knew he was a priest and gave him frankincense. And they also knew that he is not just a prophet, but the prophet. And that's why they gave him myrrh. Myrrh is actually used to prepare a body for burial. Now, that's a weird gift, okay? Someone showed up to your house at your two-year-old's birthday party, and they're like, hey, I brought some gold. You're like, awesome, you can come back next year. We want more of that. They're like, and we also brought some frankincense. A little weird, but okay, I dig frankincense. We'll take that too. Also, I brought embalming fluid. Okay, you're not invited back next year. Like, that's just weird. And that's why I think these wise men saw a little bit deeper. They understood a little bit more. And they were looking into the future of what Jesus, this child, would eventually be. That he is the priest. He is the king. And he is not just a prophet, but he is the prophet. The one who would fulfill all the other prophecies that there would be one born in Bethlehem and that one would be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver and that one would be pierced in his hands and his feet and that one would pay the price for the many and that one would carry every single one of our transgressions and would slaughter them and death to death and the sting is gone and because of what he has done, we will be redeemed and brought back and made right and have God with us with our heavenly father that he is the final prophet. They knew Jesus was not just a prophet. They knew he was the last prophet. And a prophet is a bearer of God's truth. That is the main thing they do. They take truth and they say it whether you want to hear it or not. They say it whether you think it's necessary or not. A prophet is a truth bearer. And that's all Jesus did was bear truth everywhere he went. Truth in love and truth in grace, but truth nonetheless. Always truth. And he spoke with a prophet's voice. He is God's word, which is truth made flesh. He is truth incarnate, the epitome of a prophet. And I can't help but wonder if maybe in their time that the Persian wise men maybe stumbled across an Old Testament scripture. Maybe one in the book of Isaiah that says this in Isaiah 53 verse five, but he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him and by his scourging or by his wounds, we are healed. And they saw this coming and said, we need to bring him myrrh because this is a king, the king. This is not just a priest, but the priest and not just a prophet, but the prophet. And Jesus spoke like a prophet. He did this all the time before Abraham was. I am. I am you, know, I, you, want, you, you think you know the way, you don't know the way. I am the way. And all these things he spoke of, the future things that were going to happen. And he did this to his disciples over and over. It was so confusing to them when he would say, tear this temple down, I'll rebuild it in three days. And like all these crazy prophecy things. And there's a few that we're very familiar with, like the thief on the cross. You remember this one? He's, he's, he's crucified between two, two guys and They both have done terrible things, and the one is making fun of them, mocking them. Hey, if you are who you say you are, just call angels to come down and deliver you. And and by the way, while you're at it, why don't you go ahead and get us down too, show off. You know, just making fun and mocking him. And the other guy says to that guy, what are you doing? Do you have any idea who you're talking to? We deserve to be here. He doesn't. Then he looks at Jesus and says, would you remember me when you go into your kingdom? 
And Jesus turns to him and he makes a prophecy. And he says, truly, truly. In other words, what I say is truth. Truly, truly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Prophecy fulfilled. Crazy. Here's another one that we're probably familiar with. Nicodemus. Um, Read John chapter 3. There's a crazy conversation between this Pharisee who knows a lot. Um, Nicodemus, he comes at night because he's kind of nervous about talking with Jesus and being seen talking with Jesus. But there's a great conversation where he's asking Jesus, how do I be saved? And Jesus says, you've got to be born again. And, you know, he's too smart. You know what happens when you're too smart. When you're too smart, you get really dumb. And so he's like, wait a minute. So you're saying I've got to go back into my mother's womb and be born again? Jesus is like, whoa, dude, no, we're not going there. That's not at all what I'm talking about. And he t- tells them a story to help him understand what he means. And he goes back to the Old Testament. And he says, do you remember when there was a time when the Israelites were disobedient to God and snakes were sent among the camp and they were bit by snakes? And it wasn't the snake bite that killed them, but the poison that was rushing through their veins that was killing them. And God told Moses, build a serpent, a bronze serpent on a staff and lift it up. And when they look up at the serpent, they will be saved. Do you remember that? Nicodemus is going, yeah, yeah, I I remember that. Great story. Totally believe it. I know it happened. And then Jesus said, I am going to be like that. I will be lifted up. And when I am lifted up, it's not about the bites or whatever you receive, the hurt and the pain from this world that is causing you to be separated from God. It is the poison in your very veins. And the only cure is what I'm going to do. So all men who look at me when I am lifted up will be saved. And he would prophesy to his disciples and tell them things that was going to happen. And rarely did they ever believe him. But I want to look at one, and then we're going to wrap up. And this is in John 14. He looks at his disciples near the end uh, you know, of his life here, and he says, Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Believe me, trust me. When I tell you things that seem unbelievable, when I tell you things that's going to happen in the future, just, just trust me. The way you trusted God, trust me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. And I go and I'm going to prepare a place for you. Future, I'm going to go and do this for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I am coming back again. I will come again and I'm going to receive you to myself. Remember how the entire story is all about God with us and a loving, amazing father who only wants to give great and amazing gifts to his kids. Guess what? I'm coming back for you, okay? It's, It's the culmination of everything. I'm going to receive you to myself that where I am there you may be also. And you know the way where I'm going. And then Thomas speaks up and says, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How do we know the way? And then you know this next verse. Jesus said to him, I am the way, guys. I am the truth, guys. And I am the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. I've always been the way. I've always been the truth. And I've always been the life. I am the same yesterday, today, today. And forever. Look look at this. I am the way. Because I'm the priest who provides the way. And I am the truth. I am the last prophet who tells the absolute truth of who God is and the only way to get to our Heavenly Father. I am the one who takes care of all of that. Every prophecy fulfilled in me. And I am life. Because I am the king. And where I am, there is life. In fact, life more abundant than you've ever experienced before. I am the way, the priest, the truth, the prophet, and the king, the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And guys, I've been this way since the beginning. When I was with Jacob, I showed him the truth. I showed him the truth of who he was and what he needed to go to get to where I could pour out my blessing on him. I showed him the truth. I showed Moses the way. I taught him and I showed him that there was another way, a different way. And if he would let me, I would lead him. And he would be someone that later on in the future, they would look at me, Jesus, and they would say, wow, he looks a lot like Moses, setting the captives free. You think that was on accident? It wasn't on accident. I was showing Moses the way. By the way, with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, when they were told to worship a false king, and they refused because they had too much integrity for that, I showed up, their king showed up, and they had life. And not just temporarily fireproof, but eternally fireproof because I am the giver of life. So Jesus is a prophet. Go to the next slide. A prophet to show us the truth. He's a priest to make a way. And he's a king to rule over everything and give us real 
life. So here's the question. Is he yours? Is he your prophet? Is he your priest? Is he your king? Do you know him like this? Does he know you like this? If not, today's a day. Don't let another Christmas go by. Don't let another Christmas go by where you're trying to figure this out. And I don't know. And maybe, and I'm not sure. Remember, don't let what you've always been told get in the way of the truth of who Jesus really is. If you've got a question, come talk. If you know right now, today is the day, then all you got to do right there in your seat is say, I'm a sinner and I need a savior. Jesus, would you save me? That's it. There's no magic to any of this. And I'm no one special. You do that all on your own. But if you have questions, if you need anything, please come find us. We would love to help you. We're going to sing one more song and then we'll be out of here. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for these words, for your truth that tells us exactly what we need to hear when we, when we need to hear it. And I thank you for Christmas. I thank you for the greatest gift, the gift of your son made flesh here for us to show us that we're broken, that we need a savior, but then said, I will pay the price. I will be the way. And I'll provide absolute truth. Even if sometimes we feel like we can't find the way, he is the way. Even when it feels like the truth is just outside of our reach, you are our truth. And sometimes the only life we can find might be your life. So would you give us that today? We ask this in Christ's name. Sorry, I was out of tune. Hey, he don't care if we're out of tune, though. You know what I mean? Give me Jesus. 
Let's all sing that together. Come on. Give me Jesus. questions you, you want to talk be right back there a couple of things real quick if you brought a gift you can put it in the boxes on the way out or give online scanning that qr code in front of you um the next service we have will be friday night at 7 p.m friday night at 7 p.m bring everybody we're gonna have a good time we'll have apple cider and hot cocoa and food and we're, we're gonna have songs and communion and it's gonna be an amazing time so make sure you're here friday night at seven and then no services until january the 8th January the 8th, but tune in online on our Facebook page. Uh, make sure you have our app so you can keep up with us because we're going to be doing stuff throughout the holiday season so you can keep up that way. If you got any questions or need anything, please come find us. Uh, we'll be around. Love you guys, and we'll see you right back here. Maybe Friday. If not, we'll see you 2023. Weighing heavy, is it all too much to carry? Let me tell you about my Jesus. Do you feel that empty feeling? Cause shame's not all it's stealing And you're desperate for some healing Let me tell you about my Jesus